Thank you to give me this opportunity to lecture about uh, updates on uh, some synonymic entities of the posterior fossa. I will show you how we can go from prenatal imaging with Canon to genetics. Let's begin with the first case. This patient was referred at 25 weeks due to ventriculomegaly and abnormal CNS organization. This is two axial view of the supratentorial structures and the posterior fossa, and the missed sagittal view. We are 25 weeks of the station. What do you think about the operculation of the cilian fissure? You cannot see, in fact, the cilian fissure. Instead, you have an outer adiric band of tissue here on the cortical surface, and we can see also this echogenic band on the surface of the cerebellum. And you can see also this band surrounding the brain stem. Because of this echogenic band, you have disappearance or reduction of the supratentorial parcel space, as you can see also on the MR. If you look at the mid-sagittal view here, you have a Z-shape appearance of the brain stem and a degenesis of the corpus callosum. You have the same image here, when you can see the Z-shape, but the outer band is less visible with MR compared to ultrasound. Because of the most likely poor prognosis of these conditions, termination was performed, and you have the macroscopic and microscopic features at pathological examination. If you look at the ecogic band, it is well visible here on the macroscopic examination. And there is here the histology. This is extracortical neuroglial layer, which is over migration and this pathognomonic of cobblestone lysencephaly. If you go to the posterior fossa, here, you see that the over-migration is here, surrounding the brainstem, also surrounding here the cerebellum, and you have the Z-shape appearance of the brainstem, and this is due to the fact that the brainstem is, is in initial embryonic appearance that you found at eight weeks of the station. So I show you a case where you have a specific prenatal imaging patterns of the walker warburg syndrome, which is related to cobblestone lysencephaly and over-migration. And you can have this diagnosis and make this diagnosis on the basis of the outer hydrate ecogic band and the cortical surface in the supratental space, not identified using MR, and you have the same band of tissue in the mesencephalon and brainstem. And the consequences is the reduction of the disappearance of the perceptible space, clearly demonstrated using MR, and the Z-shaped appearance of the brainstem in case within over-migration and preserved in its embryonic configuration. We can do this diagnosis as early as 14 weeks, as we did in the article. And when you see this prenatal pattern, you are most likely sure that it's related to two genes, POMT1 and POMT2, which are the most frequent genes involved in walker world syndrome. So you have all the information in uh, this article. Let's go to, uh, sorry, to case two. Case two, oh, sorry. Case two, it's patients refer at 21 weeks of the station for cerebral and extracerebral anomalies. Just have a look at the posterior fossa, an axial plane at the levels of the points, and a mid plane. You can see that there is free communication, 
between the inferior part of the fourth ventricle and the fluid fluid space, uh, the retrocerebral fluid fluid space. And on the mid-sagittal view, you have a small hair dermis, which is look maybe like a black post schist. But if you look here, a little bit above, at the level of the superior peduncles, is pathognomonic of the disease. If you move this like that, it's more evident if you know the findings. This is, in fact, the molar tooth size, which is pathognomonic of Huber syndromes and related disorder. This is a postnatal view with normal peduncle, superior cerebral peduncle here, and the fourth ventricle here. And look here, you have thickening and elongation of the peduncle, and you have the fourth ventricle here. So you have a typical molar tooth sign, which is, in fact, pathognomonic of this disease. You may have also extracerebral findings, such as ecogenic kinase, most of the, them are large, and associated with some cyst within it, and a post-axial polydactyly, as seen here. But these extracerebral features are inconstant. So the main uh, feature is this uh, uh, molar suit sign related this to horizontal orientation and thickening of the superior cerebral peduncles. But this leads to modification of the shape of the fourth ventricle. And this modification is easy to recognize on routine examination. And we publish this article on the specificity of the modification of the changes of the uh, shape of the fourth ventricle. And this is summarized here. In the normal life, in fact, the AP diameter or the fourth ventricle is uh, shorter than the transverse diameter because of the elongation of the peduncle here. You see that the AP diameter becomes larger than the transverse diameter. So if you see this, this is very pathognomonic of the Juilbert syndromes. And when you know that it's Juilbert syndromes or related disorder, you have a panel of genes because there is many genes, more than 30 genes, involved in these conditions, and you can go straight from the images to the genes. Let's move to the third case. It's, uh, in fact, two patients, patients showing a similar pattern. This is the first pa patient. I saw this patient three years ago, it's the first pregnancy, history of consanguinity, and this patient was referred for ventricular megaly at 26 weeks, associated with club fit and arthrocryposis. You are 26 weeks, we can confirm a ventricular megaly for sure, but look at the sylvian fissure. Is it a sylvian fissure of 26? No, it's a sylvian fissure at 22 or 21. So, a normal sylvian fissure. Look at the frontal horn. What do you see? You see, in fact, two echogenic mass protruding in the frontal horn. And when you look at the posterior fossa, there is a reduction of the TCD and also a mild microphthalmia, as you can see here. Now, if you do MR, this is the MR and this is the control. You can uh, see here the cortex, which is well visible. Look at the cortex here. You, there is a cortical, cortical ribbon thinning. There is a pseudo lysencephaly appearance, thin cerebral and also voluminous germinal matrix here and here, protruding in the frontal horn. If you look at the uh, posterior fossa, there is vermin dysgenesis and the brain stem dysgenesis 
with a G-shaped appearance and a typical elongation of the pons here. It's too, too long compared to normal. This is the postal MR. On the postal MR, there is, uh, in fact, here some cyst within the germinal matrix, this multiple germinal disease cyst. And see, look at the, the bones, it's very abnormal. And we have confirmation of club fit, arthropic hyposis, and microphthalmia, diagnosed prenatally, and it was uh, it gave to a, a early neonatal death. This one was similar to this case. I, I, I've seen this case in uh, 2003, uh, similar large germinal matrix, similar pattern of the cortex, and look at the brain stem, it's exactly the same thing, associated with club fit and arthrocryposis, with uh, cardiac abnormalities, and in that case, there, were continu uh, there was continuation of the pregnancy, death at uh, four days, and no pathological examination. But the patient has a recurrence in O5, and it's the same thing with major here, uh, large germinal matrix. We report this case in a series of abnormal CDN fissures, but at that time, we don't know the genes. Because of that, we uh, recently have a look at this article about mutations in tubulin, in tubulin genes, which give, in the most severe case, microlysencephaly and also voluminous germinal zone and ganglionic eminence, but also brainstem dysgenesis. This kind of, uh, the, this kind of case, you can see here in the publication with the voluminous germinal matrix, and our case was very similar to the case reported by Poretti and Balthauser about ventricular megaly and brainstem kinking, and you can see here that you have very large uh, germinal zone, and look at the brainstem, it's the same thing. And in the article, they said that the possibility of tubulin was raised, but not confirmed genetically, as in our case. We test tubulin, and it was not tubulin. Because of that, we do a whole exome sequencing, and a new gene uh, was in fact discovered, this gene, and we uh, recently published a collaborative study uh, with uh, Alexandre Raymond from Lausanne, including uh, 10 families, families, and we have six prenatal or uh, neonatal cases showing exactly the same pattern, which include a severe cerebral malformation, mimicking the most severe case of tubopathy, with a lesencephalic cortical pattern, severe parenchymal thinning, voluminous germinal matrix, severe ventricular megaly, and cerebellar and brainstem degenesis. But in tubulopathy, you don't have extra uh, CNS anomalies, and all our cases have club foot and arthrogryposis, and also visceral anomalies involving most of the time the eyes and the heart. So when you have this kind of uh, findings, think about this new gene, and we have a poster of, uh, about this uh, entity. So I show you three entities. Uh, the new genes, walker Albert syndromes, and Joubert syndromes. And as you can see here, you have perfect correlations between the sonographic findings and the MR findings for uh, the new genes, for walker Albert, and also for Joubert syndromes. So these correlations between MR and ultrasound can, can be easily achieved with fusions, as here, this is the most uh, frequent case. And uh, when uh, I discuss with a student about uh, Chiari malformations, it's difficult to understand why uh, in Chiari malformations, it's very difficult to analyze uh, the posterior fossa, because, in fact, there is disappearance of the pericerebral space, and because the size of the posterior fossa is reduced, and here you can easily understand uh, 
the, because we have the exact correlation between the absence of the fluid surrounding the cerebellum, the banana sign of the, uh, the cerebellum, this which is typical uh, for, in fact, carry one malformation. And because of that, most of the time, there is dilatation uh, of the ventricle system. And you have also something that you may have seen. And you can, this, what, what's this? You see? Uh, you will see when we come back to the supratental structures. This here, this is connection with the third ventricle. It is the suprapineal recess. And you know that the suprapineal recess, which is in fact in connection with the third ventricle, which begin to dilate before the dilatation the, uh, of the ventricular system. So in most cases, you have this small cystic structure, which is the suprapineal recess. So I think that uh, it's for me clear that for uh, academic purpose, it's very nice to do this kind of fusions between MR and ultrasound. And if I ask you what the gestational uh, age of these patients, and we'll speak uh, about uh, this later, uh, I think, on, uh, on Monday, yes. Uh, you can see here that you have the insula, and this insula is recovered halfway by the temporal lobes. You have also here the su uh, superior temporal sulcus, and because of this, this is a pattern which is typical of a patient at 28 weeks of gestation. And you can do this analyze on ultrasound and MR. So uh, just to show you that uh, when I scan, I go from uh, top to down, and you see that the midline stay in the midline. Uh, it's very important because of that, I can move my, uh, in my hand my uh, probe, and I have a perfect, not perfect, but uh, I, more than I can, uh, axial uh, coronal plane, and I move back to the axial plane. And so uh, we are discussing about uh, posterior fossa. So uh, here uh, is the posterior fossa, and you can see here that uh, you have the two, sorry, I try to, two hemispheres, and uh, that they are symmetric. You have the echogenicity of the vermis, which is always more echogenic than the ventricle, and you have the fourth ventricle here, and the AP diameter is less than the transverse diameter. And here, it's the periceptal space, and you measure the periceptal space where it's, it's the large, larger part here, and the largest part, and it should be less than 10 millimeters. When uh, you, uh, you can also uh, have a view of the foliation, the foliation is like the sulcation uh, on the cerebellum, and you see here, the uh, vertical foliation, and in some cases it can be horizontal, and it will change the ecogenicity of the hemisphere. You may see also here clearly the third ventricle, and be between the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle, you have the aqueduct, and you can follow the aqueduct. You see the aqueduct, you have the, uh, the lumen of the aqueduct here, here, and you can follow the lumen till almost the end, here. I try to show you this, here. And in some cases, when you have, in fact, isolated ventricular megaly with a dilated uh, third ventricle, you may uh, have the diagnosis of, in fact, uh, aqueduct uh, stenosis, because you don't see the lumen of the aqueduct which is clearly visible here. So uh, for this patient, I think uh, what an important thing is to know at what age gestation we are. So uh, you see that you have here the insula here, and the temporal lobe here. Uh, the insula which be recovered by the temporal lobe at 32 here, 28 
here, 26 here, and we are between 26 and 28 here, and we are around 27. In most patients, we have here the superior, superior temporal sulcus, and this patient is uh, close to uh, 27. So if it's 27, you can uh, expect uh, what is the uh, TCD. 27, it should be around uh, 30, 30. So if you uh, put here, here, you see, it's not, not far from 30. So in fact, if you don't know uh, the age uh, of the pregnancy, the maturation of the brain gives you, in fact, the indica indication. And here, you can conclude that the patient is around 27. Here, you, you see uh, clearly the uh, carbon septum pellicidae. And you know, just uh, uh, mnemonic, uh, mnemonic uh, uh, way of uh, reminding uh, here, the uh, carbon septum pellicidae should be, the AP diameter should be larger than the transverse diameter in the inverse of the first ventricle. If you have a case where the AP diameter is, uh, in fact, uh, small, and, uh, in fact, uh, uh, smaller than the AP diameter, you may uh, go to uh, uh, the degenesis of uh, the corpus callosum. So, so, if you have any question uh, on the axial plane, you see here clearly the pedangle. We can uh, also move to the coronal plane, but I will try to do. The patient have a C-section, so uh, it's a little bit uh, painful when I press, so, so I don't want to press too much. And the baby just move. It's a real, real life. So you can appreciate an oblique view <laughs> on the cerebellum. I go back to, oh. OK. Back to axial. You can see clearly the eye. Try to be good, a good boy. Or, uh, Uh -huh. So you see at least the corpus callosum. I'll try to show you. In such case, it's difficult to, to show the vermis, for sure. Hmm. I have to wait. Uh, you have any question for the axial plane? Maybe uh, I can show you one thing. It's if you are uh, at uh, 26 or more than 26, you can see also uh, the central sulcus. The central sulcus is when you go up here. You see this small sulcus here. This is the central sulcus here. And it appears around 26. So, and at 28, the uh, sulcus is uh, almost here. So, uh, it's a small depression at 26. So, we are between 26 and, uh, and uh, 20, uh, 28 because we are at 27. So, uh, just to show you sometime, uh, it's difficult to uh, have a look at the proximal hemisphere. And in, in such case, when I want to have a look at the proximal hemisphere, I do an oblique view like that. This oblique view is not for uh, measuring the ventricle because it's oblique. So it's impossible to measure uh, the ventricle because, in fact, we increase the size of the ventricle. But when you look, in fact, at uh, the, ecogenicity, uh, the ecogenicity of the plexus, the uh, plexus uh, is occupying all the ventricle 
So I'm quite sure there is no ventricular megaly. But look here at the, uh, the parenchyma. And we can have a look at calcification when you are dealing with toxoplasmosis or uh, CMV uh, infection. It's very uh, convenient to use this, this view, or even when you have um, asymmetry uh, ventricular megaly and you are uh, looking for uh, some tiny clot within the ventricle. Uh, when you do that, you see the lumen of the ventricle. You can see also some uh, nodularity when you have uh, sub heterotopia. So this view is really uh, of help when uh, you are uh, doing examination of the fed up brain. For sure, it's not routine, but uh, when uh, you are with expert in, in the fetal brain, I think it's a very uh, interesting view uh, to uh, have this kind of information. And because most of the time we say that it's impossible to explore the proximal hemisphere, doing that, you see, that uh, it's in fact very uh, easy to explore the hemisphere. So to do that, I put my probe in an axial plane and I just to uh, do an inclination of the probe and to do that, and I can uh, have a look at the uh, temporal lobe here, more uh, the occipital. If I want the occipital, it's more occipital here. You see the parieto occipital fissure, which is uh, clearly visible here. So it's a very interesting uh, view. So let's, uh, I don't think I will have more uh, chance with uh, the sagittal view, but I will try. Uh, you may ask me uh, what are this uh, line uh, here uh, in f uh, facing the uh, temporal lobes. In uh, the temporal lobe, the peristal faces are large, and there is some vein here, and it's joining vein in the subarctic space that you can uh, see. You see clearly here uh, that you have uh, uh, sorry this artery, uh, which is uh, typical uh, of, the, um, of the fetus, uh, which is a yellowed artery, uh, and this yellowed artery will disappear around 32, and we mine when you have a some kind of microstalmia. Um, Oh, if you have any question? Yes. Uh, could you please show us again the, uh, where uh, do you calculate the uh, cisterna magna? The cisterna magna? Yes. Okay. You prefer to uh, calculate from the hemisphere or the uh, vermis? Where uh, I measure it? I measure it where it is, the, uh, it is large. I, for me, if I have to measure it, the larger part is here. So, uh, so from the hemisphere? Yes, it depends. Because in some cases, you have asymmetry of this uh, peripheral space because you have an arch arachnoid cyst. So if, if you are an arachnoid cyst facing this hemisphere, you will show uh, you measure here. In some uh, very large uh, uh, megacisterna, uh, it will be larger in, uh, in this part here. So you will measure here. So yes. you have to measure the, uh, in fact, the larger part of uh, the retrocerebral field space. Okay. Okay. And another question. And yes. Uh, could you please show us the uh, posterior complex? The, uh, uh, the anterior or the posterior? Posterior. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I published about the anterior complex, but I will show you also the posterior. Uh, when I publish about uh, the entire complex for people, we are, we not, are not aware about uh, this complex. This complex uh, includes the cavum septum pellicidum, here the genio of the corpus callosum, here the two frontal horn, and it's very interesting because here you see that this one is, uh, this one is smaller than this one, so you are uh, very confident uh, in the fact that uh, in most cases, you will not have any ventricular megaly uh, on the proximal hemisphere. And you see here, in fact, the interhemispheric inter fissure. And here, you have uh, the su supracallosal sulcus. So this is anterior complex. And um, Vidal's published about the posterior complex, which is, in fact, here. You have the same kind of images with here. This is the uh, fibers 
of the corpus callosum, but you are not sure here that you are dealing with the splenium uh, because you can uh, be on the uh, posterior part of the body of the corpus callosum. So for me, it's interesting to see the posterior complex here. But uh, in that case, it's very difficult to say the corpus callosum is complete or not. Uh, the only way to, uh, to be sure that it's complete is to do a sagittal view. So I will try to do, uh, I will press a little bit hard just for a short time. I, I don't want to, to press too much, too much because it will be painful for the lady who had a C-section. So if you have uh, any other question? Um, more yes? question? You? No. OK. Can you show us the optic chiasma? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> De depending, uh, yes, here. You see, um, I will try to show you. Uh, <laughs> in fact, we have to, here the optic nerve. So uh, what you do, you go to uh, the cabum septum pellicidae. You go to uh, here, uh, you are uh, on uh, the trigon here, the uh, pillars of the trigon. And just below, you have here, here, so you have uh, the polygon of Willis. If you put uh, the Doppler here, the polygon of Willis. And depending on the uh, larger of the, this space, you may see uh, uh, that you have here two bands of tissue, which are the optic nerve, and the, here is the chiasma, where the two optic nerve here join at the uh, optic plasma. So uh, in some ca patients, it's, it, you see here, okay? you see? Uh, do you agree with me? Just, you, you can say no. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's depending of the, if we have large peristal space, it can be easy. But here, for sure, you see uh, there is optic nerve. But to measure the optic nerve and say, they are normal or abnormal, and it's very tricky. Uh, I know that uh, Jean-Philippe Beau uh, have a good presentation about optic nerve using 3D, and I think we can do that with, without 3D, but uh, the main uh, issue is to be sure if it's normal or not, and uh, it's very subjective uh, measures, in fact. Okay. I think it's time. Yeah, it's time. Okay. So, uh, great thank you okay. to the patients. Uh, she was a great, uh, and the baby was a great baby. Uh, <laughs> sorry to press a little bit hard, but uh, thank you for all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>